Okay. ¿Empiezo? Listo. Bueno, eh, les quiero dar la buenos, eh, los buenos días a los panelistas, a los a la maestra Lorena Rodríguez, al doctor, bueno, a mi corresponsable que en esta historia, al doctor Jorge Bustamante. Eh, y quiero agradecer de manera especial al doctor Luis Filipe Rochón, quien será el encargado de impartir hoy día el curso. No solamente es un gran profesor, que no, sino es un, eh, podríamos decir, amigo y colaborador que desde hace muchos años está en nuestro proyecto de investigación. En este contexto quiero agradecerle a la, a la presencia de la maestra Lorena Rodríguez Ochoa, secretaria general de la Facultad de Economía, porque no hubiéramos podido realizar este curso sin el apoyo brindado por la Facultad de Economía. En este contexto quiero agradecer también a Jesús Garrido, a la licenciada Alejandra Contreras, que nos ha apoyado mucho en hacer este curso. Eh, también tenemos que agradecer al programa de apoyo a la investigación e innovación Capapit, que en el marco del proyecto de investigación se realiza este curso. Claro, sin los participantes esto no funcionaría. Um, just to say thanks to Lorena, the General Secretary of the Faculty, as well as to Luis Philippe Rochon, who is a very distinguished professor and we may say a friend of our community since he belongs to our research project for a few years. Um, in this context, we want to thank the economic faculty, the research project of UNAM Papit, and obviously all the people who are today in uh, this session. Eh, permítame muy rápidamente decir de qué se va a tratar el curso. Se llama Política Monetaria y Desigualdad del Ingreso. Monetary Policy and Income Inequality. Creemos que en los días que es, hoy día se están, en, en, con los acontecimientos, hoy día es sumamente importante discutir esto. En estas condiciones, nada más quiero decir que habrán dos clases magistrales una de construyendo la política monetaria dominante de la impotencia a la inefectividad. The first lecture, the constructing mainstream policy from impotence to ineffectiveness. Y la segunda es reconstruyendo la política monetaria sobre las bases heterodoxas, bancos centrales y la, en la inserción de la sociedad which is reconstructing monetary policy on heterodox ground, central banks, and the intersection of society. Eh, voy a dejar al profesor Goshon que explique cada uno de los eh, cursos a medida que vaya empezando. Eh, in this sense, uh, I, I will let, uh, when you start, please, please uh, you would inform uh, what the causes are, y le daría la palabra al doctor Jorge Bustamante, amigo y responsable en toda esta aventura de divulgar la economía, discutir los problemas. Jorge, adelante, por favor. Bueno, gracias, doctora. Uh, thank you, everyone, for, for, for being here. I want to uh, thank the professor Luis Philippe Rochon for being here today. Uh, you know that always is a pleasure to have you uh, with us. Uh, and, uh, now, bueno, ahora uh, le voy a dar la palabra a la maestra Lorena Rodríguez, quien es la secretaria general de la Facultad de Economía, para que haga la apertura oficial del curso. Now I'm gonna, going to give the word to Professor Lorena Rodríguez, that is uh, going to be uh, to do the opening of this course. Thank you, Professor Lorena. Thank you very much. Thank you very much and good morning, Professor Rochon, Dr. Alevi and Dr. Bustamante and all the students and colleagues who are with us today. I'm very glad to be here to open the course Monetary Policy and Income Inequality. Thank you for the invitation. On behalf of the director, Eduardo Vega, 
I give you the most cordial welcome to the Faculty of Economics of the National University of Mexico. We highly appreciate that this type of academic exercise is carried out in our faculty. It's a great opportunity for our students and academics to, to be able to share with recognized and academically solid colleagues, such as Professor Luis Philippe Rochon, a space for exchange and construction of cutting edge economic knowledge. Also, I want to acknowledge the committed and valuable work of our dear colleagues, Dr. Noemi Levy and Dr. Jorge Bustamante, who have organized this course within the framework of the La Movilidad de Capitales en el Siglo XXI, Una Mirada a las Instituciones y Mercados de América Latina Project. I do not doubt that the result will be very beneficial and will encourage us as an institution to continue promoting these academic spaces where reflection, the exchange of arguments and points of view contribute to the generation of questions and answers to the great challenges today's economy is facing. Thank you very much, thank, thank you very much and welcome. Muchísimas gracias, profesora Lorena. Es un placer para nosotros que haga la apertura. Thank you very much, <laughs> Professor Lorena, for the, the opening. For the, the opening. Uh, now I'm going to I'm going to uh, I'm going to say a, a little bit about the, this course. You know that this is structured. Uh, this course is, is structured in two parts. Today, today session and tomorrow session. Every session is. Uh, is, uh, it has has two parts. The first part is the 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 sorry 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 the 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 presentation of uh, Professor Luis Felipe Rochon, and after that we are going to have a time for discussion and your questions and answers. And and in this time uh, we are going to open in the mic for you for your participation. No, voy a decir esto en español. I'm going to speak to Spanish. Eh, el, este curso se divide en dos, en dos sesiones, la sesión de hoy y la de mañana, y cada sesión está dividida en dos, en dos partes. Eh, primero tenemos la exposición del doctor Luis Philippe y después vamos a tener un, un tiempo para sus preguntas y discusión acerca de los temas que se, que se den en, en este curso. Eh, ahora voy a leer un poquito la biografía del profesor eh, Rochón. And now I'm going to read a little bit about uh, the view of Professor Rochon. Uh, uh, I'm going to switch in Spanish. Uh, Philippe Rochon is a professor de tiempo, de tiempo completo de la Universidad Laurentian de Canadá, donde ha, es, ha estado enseñando desde 2004. Uh, y antes de eso era profesor de la Universidad de, eh, en Michigan, en Michigan del Colegio Calama. Eh, en, en enero de 2019 se, se convirtió en el en coeditor de la revista de, de política económica y es eh, editor en jefe de esta revista desde 2021. Antes de, de esto fue eh, creador de la revista de economía keynesiana y fue editor entre 2012 y 2018. Eh, ha sido eh, editor invitado este, eh, de, de la revista Ola Financiera, en la revista, en el Journal of, bueno, el International Journal of Political Economy, en, en el European Journal of Economics and the Economic Polit Policies, Intervention and Problemas de Desarrollo, Cuestiones Económicas, Y bueno, ustedes verán que tiene mucho trabajo el doctor Rochón en términos eh, como editor y participante de estos comités editoriales. Eh, él también es editor en jefe de eh, eh, las series de Banco Central y Política Monetaria de Edward Elgar eh, y es coeditor co de, la, de las nuevas direcciones de política de economía post keynesiana Ha sido profesor visitante en, en Australia, Brasil, Francia, México, Polonia, este, Sudáfrica, Estados Unidos, eh, así, eh, China también, Colombia, Ecuador, Italia, 
Japón. Entonces, este, uh, without uh, hesitate, I'm going to give you the word to Professor Rochon. Uh, you have the word, Professor Rochon. Thank you. No, thank you. <clears throat> and thank you uh, to Noemi uh, and to you for inviting me. Um, our relationship uh, with UNAM goes back 20 years. And uh, I remember uh, many, many great times uh, uh, with, with meeting very, uh, a lot of people. Some of them are, are in here today. Um, Monica uh, Mialis, for example, and, and others that I've just seen their names. But thank you very much. It's always a pleasure. My only regret is that I cannot be there uh, in person. Uh, I would love to have a little bit of 25 degrees right now, but, um, but it is what it is. So um, this is uh, today. So this is a two day presentation. And what I want to do is sort of a very um, step by step. Today, I want to deconstruct the mainstream model. Step by step, everything about that model is going to be opened up um, and explored. And at the end of the day, we're going to find out that there's nothing left uh, from that model. And hence that the question in the presentation from um, ineffectiveness to impotence, to irrelevance. And my argument is that the mainstream model is irrelevant. To me, uh, it's irrelevant. And have, having done that, the next day, tomorrow, I'm going to rebuild uh, the, the model about central banking, but along uh, more heterodox grounds, putting concepts like vested interest and power, um, hierarchical relationships at the center of the analysis of central banks, which means that we have to place central banks, central banking at the intersection of society and the forces that we have to deal with, with like power and all of that and income distribution um, will be placed within, uh, back into the model of central banking. So I'm gonna share my screen now um, Luis Philippe, only to remind you to be slow. Yes. And eh, si hay alguna palabra que no se entienda, por favor, por el chat podemos traducir rápidamente. Hay muchos que no pueden ayudar. Entonces, sorry, go ahead. Okay, I would like to be very, very slow. And so let me begin with just uh, explaining a bit of the, the picture. This is in front, this is in fact in front of my house. Uh, the neighbor had put, the, this is a washing machine out and it was all deconstructed. And I thought it was an interesting metaphor for what I wanted to do today. So, you know, uh, I took a picture of it in order to place on here. Now, uh, let me see how to, okay. So a little bit about myself, uh, for those of uh, who know, I created the, re the, the review of Keynes in economics some 10 years ago. I am now the editor in chief of the review of political economy. And also I'm a consulting editor on a brand new journal that's coming out with Edward Elgar called Advances in Economics Education. And I'm on the editorial board, but I, I don't have anything to do with the management. I just helped them set it up. And it's a, it's a journal that will be dedicated, dedicated to issues about education and economics education. I'm also uh, the editor in chief of a banking, uh, of a series on central banking. Um, that I'm currently doing uh, for Elgar. And the first five books of that series will be coming out uh, later this summer. And, um, you know, they have, some of these topics are gonna be discussed over the next couple of days, but the future of central banking and central banking and income distribution, cent central banking and the environment, central banking and the future of money, all this discussion about e-monies, how does that, uh, impact on central banking and monetary policy. 
and central banking, monetary policy, and social re responsibility, the role or the connection between central banks and, um, and democracy. And you know, notice that all of these titles are not just monetary policy. They're about central banking and monetary policy. So central banking as an institution. Um, the next book that I'm doing, that I'm currently working on is about central banking and gender. And how does that um, institution of central banks deal with gender issues? So, um, so a lot of, like I said, the topics that we'll be discussing over the next couple of days um, are in these um, are in these books. And it's certainly a very appropriate time to be talking about central banks. Um, they are about to take a very central and leading role in economics. Uh, one. Well, because inflation is on the rise and there is questions about what should central banks do about inflation. And we know that, there, I mean, that this is what we're going to be talking about today. The traditional role that we see that we assign to central banks is that in terms of inflation, they use monetary policy interest rates to increase um, to increase interest rates in order to bring down inflation, but that assumes a relationship or what we call a transmission mechanism. And we're gonna be looking at that transmission mechanism. And what we're gonna find out is that empirically, there's no validity to that, uh, to that uh, mechanism. And that brings into question uh, what central banks, what monetary policy is and what it does and what it should be doing. Um, but even if that relationship did exist, monetary policy is about demand pull inflation. And everything we know right now about inflation is that current inflation has nothing to do with excess demand or, you know, growth or any of those demand explanations of inflation, but rather about costs and more notably about bottle bottlenecks. And so the question remains whether set, raising interest rates would have an impact on inflation if the source of inflation is not from demand, but rather from supply. And I would argue, no, I can't see how raising interest rates uh, will solve bottlenecks or will solve um, issues regarding uh, getting goods to market. So um, big question mark. And the other question is, well, you know, what if central banks raise interest rates? What will be the consequence if everything I say today, for example, is correct? And in my opinion is, well, we're phasing down the barrel of another recession. Uh, recession question mark, financial crisis question mark, because another issue is the imminent Russian debt default. So if we are to believe reports, Russia is about to default on its debt yet again. And that might have an implication on financial markets for central banks. And that scenario with rising interest rates um, might lead to a recipe for another crisis. Um, and that's not atypical of the way we see financial crises today. If you look at the history of financial crises, there's a great, great, great Wikipedia page on it. You'll see that financial crises in the history of capitalism were once every two, three, four hundred years. But now financial crises are by decades. And, um, you know, uh, I'm not sure exactly when it started, but certainly uh, the idea of capitalism as being based on a series of financial crises uh, goes back to maybe, you know, don't quote me, but I'll say 40 years, just because that's the beginning of, you know, the neoliberal era. Um, so, I mean, you know, this has to be validated empirically, but this is what I think. And so um, episodes like the tequila crisis and others, uh, the, the Argentinian crisis and now the Russian crises, um, 
are bound to repeat themselves on a more regular basis. And that's, I would argue, linked to, in part, to central banks. In this case, the Russian default is linked to other uh, other things, but central banks certainly play a vital role in this. And you know, the research by Noemi Levy, for example, on on, on crises and et cetera, and, and financial factors, um, is a good point um, of reference. So, so I'm not too optimistic about what is ha going to happen. But what I do want to do today is talk a little bit about that model of central banks, and you know, at the end of the, of, of the day, we will be left all very pessimistic, I'm sure. Okay, so let me begin very, and, and so what I want to do today is going to be just very technical, you know, very economic technical. And tomorrow's class is going to be more sort of, a, you know, Veblenesque and Polanyi and all of those great thinkers and some Keynes, and we're going to be more talking more about political economy uh, rather than pure esoteric economics today. So let me begin with an overall definition of neoclassical theory, because I think that that definition will apply uh, perfectly well to, um, to uh, monetary policy. So I think that the two words that uh, summarize neoclassical theory quite well is uh, the word convergence and the word stability. Um, and even today, even post-financial crisis of 2007, 2008, if you look at most models today, um, that concept is, those concepts are still very at much at the heart of it. It is still a model of equilibrium. Um, they may tinker on the side with some sort of instability, but it's it's very short-lived because in you know in the long run everything is very neutral and there is these centers of gravitation that ensures the stability of the model. Um, and um, and there's a lot of borrowing from the concepts of physics. Uh, stability, convergence, equilibrium. These are all uh, concepts uh, born in physics. And, and even some of the uh, classical economists uh, saw physics as an inspiration for economics. Adam Smith had a book on the history of, of astronomy where he talked about the Newtonian system, which should be at the heart of, of, of the natural world. Uh, there's also this concept of the universality of economic laws, which apply at all times, at all places. Um, you guys in, in, in Latin America are well aware of the attempt to, to impose a Washington consensus type of policies, the idea that what's good for developed countries must be good uh, for uh, developing countries. So uh, the universal, and we saw the disaster that that caused. Uh, there might be a little bit of rethinking about that. IMF is flirting with, with some ideas, but even then IMF policies, if you look closely, you know, some of their uh, newly found policies are applicable to developed economies, but I don't think there's been much of a um, advancement in terms of thinking with respect to developing countries. So all of these models, a neoclassical model, um, are fair weather models. This is what we call fair weather models. They're excellent to talk about um, disturbances that sort of, you know, um, come back and, and your model kind of shift a little bit in the short run and come back to, you know, to, uh, to the long run stability. And we know that the Queen of England had asked the economists in 2009, why didn't you see this financial crisis coming? And the answer was, well, our models just didn't predict. Our models don't predict uh, crises. And so, you know, you have to ask questions about the validity and the relevance of these models. And then this applies, in my opinion, to the model about central banking and monetary policy. It's all about centers of gravitation. You have natural rates of interest, natural rates of growth, natural rates of you know, inflation, natural rates of um, output. And, 
you know, of unemployment, you have all these natural rates, which are what? Which are centers of gravitation in the long run. Um, so, um, and even when uh, neoclassical economists venture out, and we'll explore this a little bit tomorrow, and they look at the relationship between monetary policy and income distribution or monetary policy, you know, and the environment. They're all there to say, you know, in order to justify the validity of their thinking, they all say, oh yes, 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 this is all relevant. Monetary policy does have an impact on the environment and on income distribution and on gender and all that. They admit all that, but then they go and they say, but these are all short-term problems because in the long-term, the model must respect the long-run neutrality of policy, including monetary policy. And I've got some great quotes uh, from scholars and, and, and central bankers that says, yes, central bank needs to have central monetary policy has all these consequences, but they're all short-lived. And... <clears throat> So maybe I should have added directly to my to the question uh, to my topic today, you know, inefficiency, uh, impotence, and irrelevance. Anyways, um, and then you know this brings up the question of black swans and, and exogenous shocks, from you know, and the model. Uh, I mean, the the standard mainstream model, you know, they can't predict these crises. And that's why they're categorized as black swans, right? Um, so, but for me, from a heterodox perspective, I don't believe much in black swans. I mean, for me, um, kind of everything is sort of endogenous, even, even the ecological, especially the ecological crisis. These are endogenous forces, um, crises, um, cycles, these are all endogenous. So I'm not sure exactly what, from a heterodox perspective, could be defined as a black swan. I think that if we dig a bit deeper, we would probably be able to, you know, link it to some sort of endogenous impact on the environment and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In any event, that's an open question. Uh, we can discuss that. So, you know, we are under an inflation targeting regime, which is basically the central bank targeting a very specific inflation, uh, inflation uh, rate. And in Canada, in the US, in most countries, it's either a directly a 2% inflation target or a corridor system with the inflation between one and 3%. And so on average, the central bank is looking for an inflation target of 2%. And you know, the model is you know, if inflation is above uh, inflation target, like right now in Canada, it's about 5%, 8% in the United States. Um, these are clearly above the central bank target. And so we, as expected, we find central banks now starting to increase rates and threatening with, you know several other increases this year and next year. And you know the whole purpose of monetary policy here is to um, is for the interest rate to be equal to that neutral rate or that natural rate, which could be as high up as three percent in the United States. So you're talking about you know 10, 11, 12 possible increases in interest rates because it's only at that interest rate where inflation comes down to target. And, you know, that brings up questions about whether that's going to create more harm than solve uh, any possible problems. Anyway, leading up to the current system, I'll talking about the, the, the current model in the next slide, but leading up to the current um, you know, system. We, we know that the end of Bretton Woods in 71, we had the, you know, uh, oil shocks in 73 and 79. These were very, uh, a period of the collapse of the Keynesian model, uh, collapse of the Phillips curve, an important concept that we'll be looking at. Um, but these were very inflationary uh, and a very inflationary decade. And, 
which has contributed to the rise of monetarism, the debate over uh, rules and discretion. But it was a lost decade because central banks basically lost control of the money supply. Uh, not, not a big surprise for, for heterodox economists, but nevertheless, a lost, um, a lost decade, decade. And the whole concept of rules and discretion, I just wanted to point out that Friedman was against the concept of, of discretion. He favored rules because he had a deep mistrust of central bankers. He opposed the idea of leaving um, wide discretion to independent experts. I mean, that paper by Friedman is a fantastic paper. And I've got a paper coming out in the International Journal of Political Economy where I sort of discuss this paper a lot because it's quite a gem. Uh, if you want a reference to it, um, I'd be glad to, to, to supply it. But during that lost decade, um, a couple of things happened. First of all, like I mentioned, central banks lost control of the money supply. Um, that they were under the impression that they could control. And as a result, interest rates shot up to 20%. Um, another uh, um, concept uh, that was part of that lost decade is the realization that the natural rate of unemployment was moving around all the time. So it could no longer be an anchor for monetary policy. And so today, you know, central banks don't talk much about natural rates of unemployment anymore, but they do talk about output gaps. Um, so that was sort of a, uh, an interesting development, which led to the sort of collapse of um, that model. And during the 80s, the experience with monetarism. And, you know, that has led to discussions over inflation targeting. And with New Zealand in 1990, Canada in 1991, now some 30 more countries are inflation targeting around the world. Uh, and like I said, the approach to inflation targeting is uh, seemed to be sort of very similar amongst countries, a target of around 2% on average. But what I want to argue is that um, the model has some very basic assumptions, which are proving to be problematic. And I'm, I really love this, this quote by Phil Arrestes and Malcolm Sawyer. Um, you know, it's a long and, and uncertain, uncertain is the key word, and long as well, you know, chain of events from an adjustment in the interest rate controlled by the central bank to a desired change in the rate of inflation. And that sort of anchors the presentation today. If you prefer Keynes, you know, he said that there are several slips between the cup and the lip. Um, and and what, once we deconstruct the model, we're left with maybe rather than new consensus models, maybe we, can, we should call it the new obsolescence model. Okay, so, um, let's talk about the model, new consensus model, which I think is more of a post-Keynesian expression. I don't think you see that expression used as much by the mainstream. For them, it's the neo vixellian or even the new Keynesian model. And, you know, we go back to Woodford's early model, uh, paper. We, won't, wrote, we go back to Romer, who, fam who wrote that paper, A Monetary Policy Without the LM Curve. And, of course, we can go back to Taylor. Um, uh, and, and quite a few. So, but this is, um, and in my book in 1999, in fact, I, in the last chapter on mainstream theory, I kind of talked a little bit about that. It was still very embryonic at the time, but, but, it, but it's in there. Um, and, you know, there's um, the concept of long run neutrality of money is still very much in that model despite the fact that they sort of have this theory of endogenous money, which I don't really accept, but I'm not gonna discuss. Uh, for me, endogenous money implies the rejection of the natural rate of interest, which they, this model still maintains. So big question mark for me on that, but that's a side discussion. 
But money is still seen as related to money or aggregate demand, or in fact, monetary policy. So if we don't have Friedman's direct quote that money is, every, is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon, it's still very much uh, a monetary policy phenomenon. Um, and hence why uh, monetary policy is considered dominant in the discussion over inflation. Right. In fact, fiscal policy is completely absent. If anything, fiscal policy is considered uh, inflationary. So there's absolutely no role for fiscal policy in this model. It's all about monetary policy. And, you know, central bank independence still very much uh, intact, at least in theory. You know, we could certainly start talking about whether the European Central Bank is demonstrating independence right now or, or not. But, you know, that's certainly a question mark as well. But in theory, um, if you read the latest literature, um, they still talk about uh, Central Bank independence. And of course, the model, as I said, permeates with uh, natural rates of interest on employment growth output. And I would even add the natural rate of inflation, which is the inflation target. Um, if 2% is consistent with all of these natural other rates, then 2% must be considered a natural rate of inflation. And uh, of course, anchoring agents inflationary expectations is crucial and is at the core of this model. And you know, in the communications um, of central banks and central bankers, uh, the, the idea of communicating to agents the, you know, is paramount. And the whole concept of wanting to anchor uh, inflationary expectations around the target. Uh, is clearly at the core of this model. I mean, one of the reasons advanced that um, concerning inflation targeting and, and, and the fact that it is perceived to have worked. Why? Well, because inflation has been at 2% for the last you know, 20 years, 30 years. Um, they claim is proof that inflation targeting uh, works open a discussion about current inflation rates uh, levels. But anyways, but anchoring inflationary expectation is key, except in a new paper by Rudd in Roke right now in the current January issue, you know, that paper kind of created a big, it was first published as a working paper for the Fed, I think the New York Fed, I'm not sure. And then he was invited to submit a revised version to Roke. And, you know, uh, Rudd's uh, paper is very interesting. Um, he basically says um, that um, expectations are not important. And so the whole idea of communication and et cetera, just um, is not supported uh, empirically. He says it rests on extremely shaky foundations. Um, so there's no empirical support for that. Okay. Now, let's look at uh, the Taylor model or the new consensus model. Um, Taylor argues um, that this represents, you know, uh, the new model, uh, the modern view of macroeconomics. And, and the model itself is quite elegant. I mean, it's, it's nice, it's simple, it's elegant. My God, it's three equations. Who, who can't uh, like that? There's an IS curve, which means there's an inverse relationship between real or nominal rates and output via consumption and investment. So those are the interest sensitive components of aggregate demand. So uh, yeah, the IS curve, uh, uh, interest rates go up, consumption and investment should come down. There's a Phillips curve, an inverse relationship between inflation and unemployment. So if you look at the, uh, the IS curve, if interest rates go up, unemployment goes up because output comes down. And if unemployment goes up, Phillips curve tells us inflation must come down. You see that? And then there's a reaction function, 
uh, which contains a natural rate, which is, has been called the Taylor rule. And so that rule will, will um, dictate that interest rate goes up and down relative to what's happening to the inflation rate. Uh, so if inflation is above target, we raise the rate. And by raising rate, equation one tells us that output comes down and unemployment goes up. Equation two tells us if unemployment goes up, inflation comes down. So you use uh, interest rates in a countercyclical way to try to create a situation of a soft landing where the economy sort of just gravitates towards equilibrium with very little cost to the overall economy. That's the theory. And, you know, like I mentioned a couple of slides ago, th this is nothing new. This is all rehashed uh, monetarism, leftover monetarism, which is what prompted Marc Lavoie to say this is old wine in a new model. The only thing that could be seen as different is, is equation three, a reaction function. But um, you know, it's interest rates rather than money supply. But I had a conversation with Ben Friedman, Benjamin Friedman, when I was writing my, my, my dissertation in the late 90s, and I emailed him and I said, you know, you have models with interest rates. Uh, how come? Why not money, money supply targeting? And he wrote back saying, doesn't matter. The model stays the same. And that reference is in my book, in fact. And, uh, and you know, he's right. You've just exchanged one control variable for another, and you've left everything else the same without thinking whether that has consequences. So this is, you know, the model, very elegant, very simple. Uh, you have a Taylor rule here. You have the inflation gap, the output gap. So if inflation, and, and these are assigned weights, gamma, gamma naught and, ga, and gamma one are weights. And, you know, in most models, gamma naught is closer to one. Um, today with sort of flexible uh, uh, inflation targeting, maybe gamma one is given a little bit more weight. Well, I have a little bit of something to say about that. But if inflation is above, interest rates go up, and you have that IS curve relationship, then that Phillips curve relationship. Fantastic. Well, let's explore the model. There's eight things I want to talk about. The inflation targeting as a policy itself. The IS curve, the Phillips curve, the natural rate of interest. The concept of fine-tuning. Demand side inflation, which I talked a little bit about before, CBI, I want to go back to that a little bit. And finally, the concept of monetary policy dominance, which was a subject of a, a series of paper I did with Mark Setterfield that you may know on interest rate post Keynes and interest rate rules, uh, which has become sort of uh, a dominant now in the post Keynesian literature. So yeah, inflation targeting, not much difference. Uh, central banks were always preoccupied about inflation. The only thing that's different, and if you look at the literature, is that they argue that in the past, inflation expectations were not anchored. Um, Q Rudd's argument, but they're not anchored. And so therefore, um, the the innovation with inflation, with inflation targeting is precisely that. Now, we may have a side discussion about why this obsession with inflation, um, but that has to deal, I think, with vested interests and all. Um, anyways, um, but, uh, you know, it's an, old, it's, it's an old idea, even Irving Fisher, had written about something very close to the idea of, uh, of inflation targeting uh, back at the turn of the century, previous century. So an old idea. But in today's uh, system, as I mentioned, 2% is the target, uh, but why 2%? And in fact, I went back to read a lot of uh, literature and especially with uh, at the Bank, uh, Bank of Canada, which was one of the first inflation targeted is the Bank of New Zealand. And I read, you know, 
other stuff. And it's very difficult, if not impossible, to find a justification of why 2%. And it matters because if inflation targeting, if they had agreed on an inflation target of 5%, for example, uh, you know, we might be having a very different conversation around inflation today and around monetary policy. So the choice of the 2% is very important. But Benjamin Friedman wrote in this brilliant paper in 2018, which was in the Fesch Rift for um, uh, Constancio. Um, he writes, there is the arbitrariness, right? Such beautiful words, arbitrariness surrounding the current 2% target. In retrospect, the paucity, meaning the lack of serious empirical research underlying the identification of the 2% norm, now quite some time back, listen to this, is a professional embarrassment. I mean, these are strong words coming from someone <coughs> who is a key figure in the mainstream Keynesian literature. So, you know, yeah, there was um, zero or very little empirical support discussion for a 2% inflation target. Emmanuel Carré, a brilliant French economist, heterodox economist, in a paper uh, published last year, uh, wrote, economic theories have played a limited role in the creation of inflation targeting. And I interpret that to mean the same thing. I mean, there are theories because, you know, the, the model is based on Phillips curve and IS. There are these theories, but I think that there's no theory of inflation targeting very much in the same line as uh, Ben Friedman's quote. Now, <clears throat> the question of whether IT has been successful, uh, these are old quotes and I'm trying to, except for maybe, you know, maybe Boreal, but, um, you know, there's no empirical, not lots of empirical support for the idea um, that that's, uh, inflation targeting central banks have been more successful in bringing down uh, inflation. And in fact, we just, if you look at today, uh, inflation is on the rise, despite the fact that those central banks are targeting. Um, I'll have something to say about, uh, about inflation, why it's been successful. I think it has been successful, but I'll explain to you why. I think it has been successful because Central banks have weaponized inflation targeting. And look at the comments of the governor of um, the UK Central Bank a couple of weeks ago, where he said, workers cannot ask for more than 2%, right? So you have unions, you have wages, not increasing, uh, stagnant, and that's why inflation has been low. And that's why people can, call, can claim success over inflation targeting, but not because of anchoring of expectations, but because it, ha it is being used as a threat against, uh, against workers. And as I say tomorrow, uh, it's based on conflict. Okay. Um, so these two quotes, and you know, there's also other quotes who, and I haven't put them there, but I have a, a bunch and bunch of other quotes that says um, that basically, it is also just a question of luck. And, you know, that's the expression they use. Uh, we've just been lucky for the past 30 years with inflation when it comes to inflation. Now, um, I don't think it's luck. I think it's oppression of workers and uh, worker, workers' demands for higher wages. But anyways, um, and Borio here says, have we asked them overestimated our ability to control inflation? Well, we'll soon find out, uh, but I think it's yes. So, so that was a discussion over the inflation target itself, no real empirical support for a 2% target. Okay, so that's one notch in the model that we've kind of knocked down. How about the other one? Well, this is your traditional IS curve. Um, and, uh, 
uh, where central bank, you know, you know, the MP curve as opposed to the LM curve, it's monetary policy curve, it's sort of a, you know, target interest rates. Uh, great, great, great. And this is your IS curve. So, you know, as predicted, if you move that interest rate, you're moving up and down along that IS curve, and you are going to impact your, your interest sensitive components of aggregate demand in the right way. So this curve is said to be well behaved and it has to be elastic. Because if you can imagine an IS curve that's not that's inelastic, well, monetary policy loses degrees of freedom. Uh, so you have to have that curve more or less, you know, a nice elasticity such that you can have a good range of, um, of impact uh, on output. Okay, well, except that, um, you know, there is lots of empirical support questioning the validity of the IS curve. Um, Stephen Fazari is one who has done a lot of research on this. And, you know, he's part of this quote um, in a book that was edited uh, by uh, Barry uh, Cinnamon, Stephen and, and, and Mark Setterfield, in which, you know, they say, you know, there's no relationship between interest rates and consumption or interest rates and investment. Now, let me say this. I don't think that's entirely true. I think there is a relationship. What this quote should have said is that there's no relationship between incremental changes in interest rates and uh, in uh, interest rates and consumption and investment. But if you increase your interest rate 10, 12 times, which central banks do, eventually you will collapse your economy, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, raising interest rates uh, from 0.25 to 0.5 to 0.75 to one, you're not going to have that desired IS output impact uh, right away. Um, okay, so this is a bunch of heterodox economists who cares. Well, how about people from the Federal Reserve in New York, Sharp and Suarez? I mean, paper's not all that old. A large, large, large body of, of, of empirical research offers mixed evidence at best for substantial interest rate effects on investment. Our research find that most firms claim their investment plans to be quite insensitive to decrease in interest rates, right? You can bring a horse to water, you can't, you can't make it drink, and only somewhat more responsive to interest rate increases. Well, that calls into question, right? Uh, the determination of the investment function. What is it? What does, what do investments, what does investment depend on? Well, you know, statistically, apparently not, not the interest rate as a solo variable. So there must be something else going on with investment. And, you know, we know what's going on with investment. But anyways, um, and then Krugman. Um, Krugman says, it's a dirty little secret of monetary policy that changes in interest rates um, has, um, has no direct effect on business investment. It's so small that it's hard to even see it in the data. What drives such investment is instead perception about market demand. And you know, I would certainly agree with that. And there's probably something about the effect of interest rates on, on, um, on uh, housing market. Maybe, maybe because, and again, we have to differentiate between incremental changes in interest rates and interest rates. But uh, so there you go, a, 19, a 2019 IMF paper, um, there appears to be little unexplained component of business investment beyond the expected demand effect. There is, appears to be little unexplained component, right? Interest rates is part of that unexplained component. Other factors such as the reduction in the cost of capital thus appear to have played a relatively minor role. So whereas, you know, I was quoting some post Keynesians before, but now I'm quoting IMF and Krugman and Federal Reserve Bank. So, Okay, the conclusion is 
that that IS curve must either be fairly inelastic or some sort of maybe weird L kink shape or something, but it's not your well-behaved IS curve. Now let's talk about the Phillips curve. Sorry, I couldn't do a, a curved curve here. But uh, again, inflation, unemployment, you have this inverse relationship, which for decades led to the discussion over uh, policy mix or policy choice, where um, you had to choose between unemployment or inflation um, in contrast to, you know, post-Keynesian or MMT literature that says, you know, you can have low unemployment and low inflation, uh, but that requires a correct interpretation of what inflation is. But there you go, this is your sort of traditional mainstream model in post Keynesian economics. The Phillips curve would be something like this. You have a long, long flat component, which you would have various levels of unemployment corresponding to more or less a fixed inflation rate. And if you look at the data in the last 40 years, that's sort of what you, we've had. We have had inflation rate hover around the target, but at various levels of unemployment. Okay. Well, let's talk about the Phillips curve. And oh, wow, that's just a can of worms. And I must have, and I'm not kidding, about 100 quotes from people saying there's no Phillips curve. Okay. Claudio Borio was perhaps one of my most favorite mainstream economists at the, uh, at the Bank for International Settlement. Um, the response of inflation to a measure of labor, labor market slack has tended to decline and become statistically indistinguishable from zero. So he's saying that statistically, the Phillips curve is completely horizontal. Um, Oh, I've put the same quote twice, my apologies. Arrestus and Sawyer, oops. Anyways, uh, I don't know if I can, I know how to go back. But um, again, another quote, Bob Solo, who I published, you know, Bob Solo, who won the Nobel Prize. I published Bob's, uh, this is from a paper that I published in, in Roque on that special issue on Friedman that, that, that I did. The slope of the Flix curve itself has been getting flatter. Uh, Bob Gordon, you know, this uh, again in the same issue of Roke that I did, the slope of the short run inflation unemployment relationship has flattened. Janet Yellen, um, you know, a measure of the responses in the chain to a decline in labor market slack has diminished very significantly since the 60s. So there's a huge, huge, but, but if you think about monetary policy depends more so on that Phillips curve. And that led um, I'll say, you know, just a couple more quotes. This is from the labor statistics. Politano, um, who I follow a lot on Twitter, he's got very, very, very good um, uh, informative papers. Um, it's broken down, et cetera. I'm not going to read all the quotes. Um, but one of the consequences is if you don't have that Phillips curve, it, it causes a lot of problems for central banks. And that's why you have a lot of papers uh, on, um, on the quest for the new Phillips curve. Uh, some people think that the Phillips curve is there. It is through real estate market. Uh, that's how you have an impact. Um, anyways, um, so we've knocked down the concept of the target of the IS curve of the Phillips curve. Natural rate of interest. I'm not gonna spend any time on this because we all know that it is a completely false uh, concept. Um, and, uh, you know, here's a couple of quotes that says that, but there's literally hundreds more. And I remember being at a conference and I asked um, ah, Charles Goodart. I asked Charles Goodart at a conference and I said, you know, if you 
if you know that the natural rate doesn't exist, what do you do? And his answer as a central banker was, oh, well, you know, you just assume that it works. And, you know, remember that the joke we tell in economics about the can of beans and how about we just assume the existence of a can opener? You know, how do you open the can of beans? You assume you have a can opener. It's, it's, it, it's the exact same thing. And this is what I certainly took from his answer. Oh, no, I don't know how to go back. Um, let me, there you go. And so in terms of fine tuning, uh, number five, you know, fine tuning, you know, it's, it's using, you know, if you have an old fashioned radio from your grandparents and you're trying to get that radio station and then you turn the knob back and forth, back and forth until you get precisely uh, the channel. Um, but first of all, I want to say this is not what central banks do. They don't fine tune. Uh, mark my words, fine tuning would mean that interest rates just went up in many countries. They're going to bring it down. They're going to bring it up again, maybe a couple of times. They're going to bring it down. That's not what central banks do. Once they start raising interest rates, they raise interest rates, you know, 10 times, maybe more. That's not fine tuning. That's, you know, turning the knob completely to one side. But look at Joan. Uh, look at good old Joan. Uh, this is a fantastic pamphlet in 1943. She did a presentation for, you know, the UK Workers Union, and it was published as a little, little pamphlet, and it is fantastic. And, you know, she says, the regulating effect of changes in the rate of interest was at best very weak. She's challenging this concept of fine tuning. Uh, in 1952, she goes back and she calls it a false scent using countercyclical monetary policy, and she rejects the conception of an economy which is automatically held on a path of steady developments by the mechanism of the interest rate. Fantastic. Um, and, you know, this is what Setterfield and I wrote uh, a decade ago or more. Because reaction functions rely on fine tuning the economy as needed, the central bank's policy obsession with inflation often translates into repeated increases in the rate of interest until the economy finally deflates or collapses um, in the misguided pursuit of a soft landing. This is what I called uh, in a paper called, uh, I called it the holy grail, the pursuit of the holy grail. Um, and, you know, a bunch of post Keynesians have commented on that. Uh, inflation control can be achieved only at the cost of large losses in economic activity by Mark Lavoie. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not fine tuning. It's just turning the interest rate knob to the extreme, collapsing your economy. And then, you know, asking what went wrong. And then, you know, in the book on central bank and monetary policy and social responsibility, some of the authors tackle that question. You know, and, and if you remember John Smithen's book about the revenge of the rentier, there are always winners and losers, even with monetary policy. Now, the focus of tomorrow's talk is seeing the rate of interest as a source of revenue. And you crank that interest rate high, you are basically giving rentiers increased revenues. Uh, and you collapse your economy, create unemployment, the wage share goes down, workers are uh, left holding the bag. So monetary policy is indeed rooted in conflict. What I called elsewhere um, a class bias, right? There's an in inherent built-in class bias in central, in central banking. Talk about that tomorrow. Okay. Well, let's talk about demand side inflation. Well, you know, uh, monetary policy could theoretically, according to them, work if inflation was a result of demand issues. But what we've done up to now is we've completely assaulted every single argument of that model. And even if inflation were demand determined, you still have a black box. We're still left with a black box because you have to justify how do changes in interest rate through that black box affect inflation. 
Well, those mechanisms that we discussed don't seem to be empirically valid. So what are the way? Maybe through exchange rates. That's a possibility, which you guys would know a lot more about. But certainly that's, you know, a, a real... Um, a real mechanism. And maybe in the end, that's all that is left of that sort of demand side impact of monetary policy. But even if, um, oh, and then, you know, as I argued very, very early on, post Keynesians are of the opinion that much of inflation is explained through through supply side or uh, wages versus uh, uh, productivity issues. And with wages being stagnant over the last three decades or so more, um, you know, playing with interest rates uh, won't affect that. Um, so the model becomes irrelevant completely irrelevant in a situation where inflation is more the result of supply side considerations. Um, so, um, you know, and you do have a lot of, uh, Jamie Galbraith sort of had a, a piece recently in, in the last month where he argues without agreeing with it, but he argues what the central banks are doing is they're gonna start raising an interest rates. And despite the fact that much of inflation is, is determined by supply, there is a little bit that's determined by demand and that's what they're gonna to try to weaken. And to do that, they're gonna to have to raise interest rates a lot so that that affects that demand component sufficiently that it brings inflation down. I'm not, anyways, I, uh, yeah, for me, uh, it, it doesn't matter. Okay, so um, central bank independence, I'm not gonna say a lot on it, um, but you know, I mentioned Friedman being against independence, but it is a dominant sort of argument in, in, the, in the literature, in the theory at least, the idea, and especially now, with inflation, we see these arguments of central bank independence coming back because we're saying that central banks must be independent of governments in order to fight inflation, right? That's the traditional argument, except um, I don't think cent central banks are independent at all because uh, if we believe Jerry Epstein in his sort of the Blairian argument of vested interest and Mario Sicareccia, who wrote a paper uh, three years ago, four years ago in the Journal of Economic Issues on whose vested interests are central banks protecting. Um, we, we can't uh, help but conclude that central banks are dependent on the opinions of financial markets or Wall Street. Right, um, you know the the, the dominant uh, idea because behind central banking is the concept of credibility, and they do not want to lose cre credibility, so they must therefore appease um, the interests of of uh, uh, markets, Wall Street. And one of the things that they want, that Wall Street wants, is a reduction in that interest rate. Inflation erodes wealth. And so by eliminating inflation, you restore uh, or you increase uh, uh, real wealth. And so the pursuit, when I asked the very beginning, why are central banks obsessed with inflation? Because they are obsessed with uh, catering to the needs of Wall Street. Uh, they want to make sure, and you know, they come from those circles. You know, president of one Wall Street firm becomes governor of the central bank, et cetera, et cetera. So they're all from those from those circles. So um, Jerry Epstein's, where central banks are independent of the executive branch of government, they tend to be dependent on the financial sector for political support, uh, for legitimacy, uh, and therefore tend to make policy with finance colored glasses. Um, so this, I think, is an act 
accurate sort of uh, uh, interpretation, which will be the focus of tomorrow's talk. Finally, monetary policy uh, dominance. Uh, I just wrote a, a blog that was published this week where I argue this. I mean, what, what is the problem we're trying to solve? Um, if you're trying to solve inflation, uh, you have to ask the question, are there other means of fighting inflation? Um, maybe there's a role for fiscal policy in fighting inflation. Uh, a few uh, heterodox economists are coming out with policy proposals aimed at around the price and wage controls. Um, I don't think wage controls is a big issue, but you know some sort of controls of prices and costs in some sort. Um, I think there's a, there is some uh, price gouging going on. I think there are companies who are taking who are taking um, who are uh, taking advantage of the confusion to raise prices in order to raise uh, profits. Um, I think there's a lot of that happening, and you know in the end, central banks probably can't do much about that. But there is a role uh, for uh, for governments to play fiscal policy. Um, to play in terms of maybe regulations. But, you know, let's explore that uh, because we know that monetary policy can be a blunt instrument, a very asymmetric instrument that can do a lot of harm if those interest rates are pushed too high. Conclusion. Well, so <clears throat> in the past hour or so, I've sort of deconstructed the model step by step. Every equation, every variable, every idea of the mainstream model. Um, and we're left with the question of what's left. Um, and, you know, is the model, is monetary policy uh, impotence? Now, this impotence argument was um, at the heart of Larry Summers' argument, right? He wrote a paper called Wither Central Banking. And, you know, I mean, they're arguing uh, in terms of um, in terms of you know low interest rates, you know uh, lower bound sort of policies, uh, and you know we all know since Keynes that you know you can't you can't push on a string, and uh, there's a great oh I should have put that great quote by John Robinson, you know it's the exact same thing you can't you can't bring a horse to water and force it to drink. Um, and so, you know, Adair Turner would say, yes, monetary policy is impotent at low rates. We know that. But my argument in terms of impotent is, in fact, much broader. I'd argue that monetary policy is impotent at low rates and uber non-impotent at high rates, right? It's the concept of asymmetry. Too, too strong at high rates too weak at low rates. And so it becomes, um, its use is, is, you know, you have to use with very carefully. And that's the whole argument between those interest rate, uh, post gains and interest rate rules that I developed with Mark Setterfield, you know, the parking it approach. And, you know, for the record, all of those activist rules, activist post Keynesians, uh, Tom Pally, uh, Bob Polin and others who still advocate um, the use of interest uh, monetary policy fine tuning, but they would argue in terms of a different target, some sort of real target like unemployment growth, or capacity utilization. Or something. For me, the model still suffers from the exact same criticism that I uh, discussed throughout. So in the end, uh, you can't have, in the end, inflate, inf any type of targeting or, or real targeting can is not compatible with the true theory of endogenous money. And, uh, and so QE, which I haven't even discussed and I won't, I might discuss a little bit tomorrow. Um, QE is the result of this impotence. It's the fact that central banks knew that there was nothing they could do Nothing more they can do once the interest rates were at the lower bound. And there was a search of trying to remain relevant in the discussion over the financial crisis and the COVID crisis. If interest rates are near zero, what else could we do 
And that's where the concept of QE was born. Um, but QE was also non-successful in terms of relaunching uh, investment. And that because that points to a much broader question about what does investment depend on, which we won't get into, we won't get into it tomorrow either, but it does point to a bigger question of what determines investment. Um, so I think that's it. I Thank think you. It. Thank you very much, Professor Philippe, for, for this marvelous presentation. And now we have time for, for, for your questions. Uh, I don't know, uh, you know, in the morning we had a, an incident, a hacker incident, and for this reason, we can not open the, the mic. And we ask you that put your questions in the chat. We already have three questions. Uh, I, I'm going to put it up for you to read it uh, in this sense. Okay. The first one, I'm going to put it right now. This is the first one. Are you going to read it or? Uh... It's for uh, you. I... The relation between the dollarization and the war and whether um, we will shift to, um, to the Chinese currency in terms of the war, of the Ukrainian and Russian war. Uh, this is one. The second one is related to which- Let, let, let me just ask. Let me answer them one by one because my memory. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Here you have it. I no. Well, well so we'll... let me answer the question of de-dollarization. Look, I think that I'm having this discussion with with Lavoie and Sekereccia by email this week, and um, my argument, and uh, they agree, is that the loss of hegemony takes centuries. It doesn't, it doesn't happen over a few years. It doesn't happen over one, um, one incident like uh, the, the Ukrainian war. Um, uh, you know, if you look at the loss of the loss of the British hegemony of the British pound, it took centuries and it took a world war and it took uh, the reconstruction of Europe through the Marshall Plan. And these are forces that were in the making for a couple of centuries at least. With the uh, US dollar, it's only been, you know, not even a hundred years uh, that it's been dominant. So I think that you're looking at many more, um, many more years, many more decades. Um, if you look at, you know, the US dollar is still about 61% of foreign reserves in most central banks around the world. You know, the, the, in fact, the Canadian dollar is held, uh, is about 3.6%, about the same as, as the Chinese, uh, the Chinese uh, currency. So I don't think, I don't see um, uh, the Chinese currency, uh, the renminbi taking over the American dollar anytime soon. I don't see the Euro doing that either. Um, it's not going to happen in my lifetime and it may or may not happen in your children's lifetime. These are, you know, long, long, long waves of, uh, of, uh, of forces that I don't think are there right now. By the way, the dollar has been dominant since 1930. So yeah, well, that's what I said, it hasn't about been a hundred years by now. Yeah. It's 90. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, I agree. We have, we have three, three more, three more questions. Well, I wouldn't say 1930. I would say the 1940s. It's with the Marshall Plan. What no, late the Marshall, but so it's only been 75 going years. Around. 75 years, and I think it's going to take another. You know, I, I'm, I don't have a crystal ball, but you know, <laughs> decades or centuries to bring it down. That's right. Anyway, it depends who will win the war. Okay. Uh, the, the second question is the relation between policies, employment, no matter the inflation rea uh, reaction. So what's the question? Do you consider, I, I suppose, do you consider the, that policies might 
improve the employment, no matter the inflation reaction? So I'm just trying to figure out, I think there's a word missing in the question. Do you I think what policies may improve employment? Ah, ah okay. You know, uh, thank you. There's uh, there's quite a few policies out there. Um, you know, like job guarantee, for example, which I think is, you know, is perfectly fine. I'm not opposed to that. But I think that the first thing that you need is a, a commitment by governments uh, to, to some sort of concept of full employment. You know, employment, uh, employment is uh, not a big is not big on the radar of governments. Look, I truly believe that if there's one thing that the, the COVID has taught us is that anything is possible. If the government wanted to create jobs, it could. It's that simple. Um, and I really believe that. Um, you know, we know that you could develop some sort of a, a, a industrial strategy. We know that you could develop some sort of maybe import substitution policy, for example. You know that we can, you know, direct, um, uh, <clears throat> direct, create direct jobs if the government wanted to. But I don't think the governments want to. I don't think so. I think that um, uh, a lot of people, a lot of segments of society are happy with you know, wages being, you know, this is Kaletsky people, you know, um, and his optical to full employment. You know, I think that if you create too many jobs and workers are too empowered, you're going to shift power. And I don't think that, and I think a lot of people on, you know, why do we call it Wall Street versus Main Street, right? I think if you give too much power to Main Street, you're going to have a lot of uh, a criticism from Wall Street. So the, to answer your question, yeah, there are a lot of policies and we can sit down and we can all think about good policies uh, to create employment. And the question, you know, mar and governments will tell you, oh, it's all, you know, market fundamentals and, and all of that. But in reality, they could, they certainly could do it. Thank you, Luis Philippe. Uh I completely agree with you. It's a problem of political power, yeah. not of technicalities. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, there is another question. Thank you, Marcia, professor from our postgraduate department. Um, she says, thank you for excellent conference, Professor Roshon. Is it possible to redirect monetary policy approach to modify inflation targeting in favor of higher growth? The Fed had in the in, uh, in 2007 crisis and during pandemic the advantage of itself helping with zero lower bound interest rate. Yeah, you know I think that um, for me, uh, you know I'm a I'm a I'm a Keynesian through and through or a Keletkin through and through. I don't think monetary policy should be used to encourage growth or not. I think, and that's, and that's exactly what I'm gonna be talking about tomorrow. I think that um, your best bet is sort of, because of this asymmetric nature of monetary policy where it has no effect at low rates, it has a tremendous effect at, at high rates, that we should creep, keep monetary policy within a certain range, uh, a medium range. And then, you know, Use fiscal policy. One of the advantages of having a lower bound, uh, my sister is here today listening, and uh, just for her and maybe others, lower bound is just basically zero interest rates or interest rates near zero. So one of the advantages of having interest rates near zero for the past decade or so is the fact that, you know, interest on government debt has been negligible. And that has supported fiscal policy tremendously. Now, uh, for me, this is certainly how I interpret uh, parking it uh, rules. Set interest rates low, keep them there, and then use, give those degrees of freedom to, to fiscal policy. And fiscal policy can do wonderful things. It can target, it can be general, it can be very specific, and, and you'd be surprised. And, you know, <clears throat> 
look, at the end of the day, and I've flirted around this concept, you know, investment, which drives the economy, inflation, investment depends on expectations of aggregate demand. And despite the fact that interest rates were zero, investments didn't, didn't, didn't uh, move. Why? Because the expectations of aggregate demand, and it's not only expectations of aggregate demand. Firms must believe that the expectations of aggregate demand are permanent. If they expect aggregate demand to go up and go back, come back down, right? They must expect aggregate demand to go up and remain there permanently, right? An investment is a permanent increase in the capacity to produce, which has to be met by the a permanent increase in the capacity to receive. So, you know, interest rates alone doesn't do anything for growth. I'm not a big fan of using monetary policy to target growth or any other thing like that. I think that we have to use uh, fiscal policy. Thank you, Luis Philippe. Uh, I should remind that when Latin America had huge rates of growth in the 50s and the 60s, monetary policy was used to finance economic yeah. growth, yeah. not to hinder it. Um, yeah, but you I, finance it by keeping them low so that governments can spend and absorb the it, payments. It. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if that's what was meant by the question, sure, sure, sure. Um, there is a, a request whether you can share your slides. I will send well, them to you, absolutely. We have Thank another question much. by Mario Aceves. Wait, uh, uh, there is a uh, Luis Angel. Uh, si quieres, hago y después sigues tú. Uh, what would be the subject or subsubjects that the economy of today and the future should develop to uh, have a more meaning, to be more meaningful? I hope, Luis Angel, I'm uh, translating correctly your answer, your question. Um, Luis Philippe. Say that again. What? What are the subject or subsubject that the economy of today and the future can unite for the uh, for things to evolve? In what shall we deal more? You to, know, uh, go ahead, please. You know, I'm not sure if this is going to answer your question, but. You know, I, I've been hearing for 40 years that neoclassical theory is about to collapse and it hasn't and it won't. And uh, um, I'm not sure what to do to unite or to move forward is we just have to keep going. I mean, neoclassical theory is revealing itself to be to being quite silly, isn't it? And, you know, when I teach it to my students, my students are just going, you know, what? They can't be true, um, but you know you're dealing with a lot of powerful, you know, powerful vested interests. That's what you got to understand. It's all about vested interests. It's it's not you know, it's not about ideas. You know, you know, in the sciences when you know when we when we demonstrated that the sun did not rotate around the earth, that theory was abandoned. Uh, in Look at what I did, and today I, 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 I've knocked down so many of the elements of, of that model, but you know, nothing's going to happen to that model. There's still always going to be explanations as to yes, but, yes, but, yes, but. Um, one thing before I hand the microphone to Jorge is please remember that tomorrow we'll start 11.30 and there is another um, connection a number another uh, another link another link another link to enter the course jorge por favor sigue haciendo las preguntas okay mario aceves is ask you uh, could you comment a little bit more uh, on the ineffic inefficiency of quantitative easy easy yeah i mean the idea behind quantitative quantitative easing uh, i wrote a paper on that actually I uh, can't remember where, but um, the idea was twofold. One was to reduce long-term interest rates. So that would sort of encourage investment. Um, two, 
it was to um, give banks more liquidity in order for them to lend more. So there was this concept of the money multiplier that the reason investment was not taking place is because interest rates were too high and banks were not lending because they didn't have the funds for it. Well, that's completely contrary to endogenous money. And so, um, but those were, you know, if you look at some of the papers by the Fed at the time, the two arguments sort of came back over and over again. Um, but in the end, what happened with, uh, with QE is that it simply, um, it simply um, increased the wealth of, uh, of those asset holders. That's what it was. And there's lots of love. And Pettifer wrote a little book on it. I'm not sure where people find the time, but she wrote a little book on it. And where, you know, QE basically contributed to in widening inequality. And, 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 and tons of, oh, there, there's so many papers now that come out and say that. And I think that that's what QE was about. Uh, I have a quote by uh, someone at the Bank of England that said, uh, you know, when interest rates came down, the revenue of the, the revenue of bondholders went down. So central banks substituted that in order to support their wealth. So uh, when the revenue of bondholders went down, central banks stepped in to support the wealth. Um, so you know, yeah, we've got uh, a lot of decks stacked against workers for sure. Okay. Thank you. Adelante, Jorge. I don't know if we have uh, enough time for the questions. How much time do we have left? Uh, it depends on Luis Philippe and Jesus. Okay, okay, okay. But we have another question from um, Diana Saavedra. What are the effects of money, monetary policies from the developing countries over the developing economies dynamics, taking in account the COVID crisis and the COVID-19 pan pandemic? Can I add something to it? Yeah, of course. Uh, uh, there is an issue that actually mainstream economics dealt with in the issue of the fear to float. If we put exchange rates into the uh, picture, yeah, we show it very clearly that the problem that they uh, that uh, managing interest rate really affects the labor market. And this is something that uh, Calvo, and I think with Reinhardt, uh, wrote. So it's sort of uh, acknowledged even by the mainstream. Go ahead, please, Luis Philippe. Well, you know, I'm, I get asked those questions a lot, and I think you have a lot better qualified people in Mexico to answer those questions. Uh, but for one thing that I've learned is precisely what Noemi mentioned, the, the exchange rate, which is not something that we discuss much here in Canada. Um, Central banks, Bank of Canada rarely mentions the value of the dollar. Uh, the same thing with the Americans. Americans never mention the value of the dollar. So I'm going to let leave that question to be answered by, by specialists in, in Mexico and Latin America, because I, A, I don't want to get in trouble, and two, you, are, you really are better qualified. Thank you. Okay. Jorge. Maybe we have another question. Time for another question. Uh, Nancy, uh, I just ask you. Nowadays, there are biggest transnational enterprises constructing very po powerful networks that involve that involve in, uh, in in all in all sectors. In that way, the political economy is subordinated to the expectations of these enterprises. It is possible that central banks or the political econ economy in general could be in hands of the government or maybe the governing is just the gendarmerie of that enterprises. Yeah. No, there is another question by Mario Aceves. Did you put it through? I Are don't you... know, Mario Aceves. Yes. Thank you for your amazing conference. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Could you comment? No, it's a, this, this is. Uh, uh, you, this, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Luis Philippe already answered that. 
Yes, please. So what am I answering now? The question about enterprises. Yeah, I'm not sure how to answer that. I'm not, uh, I'm not sure I quite understand the question. Um, I mean, I, I don't know how to link in monetary policy interest rates in that, sorry. <laughs> okay. 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 The one of Luis Raul. We have the, the last question. Uh, you have made very interesting points today regarding the validity, the validity of, act, of actual economic behavior and the assumptions made by mainstream economics thought. I agree with you. They have not all, all the answers where we should look for those answers. In the data, look, I firmly believe that the data um, validates much of what post Keynesians and heterodox people have to say. You know, when I refer to Paul Krugman's quote where he says, we can't find that relationship in the data. Um, yeah, look in the data, the data, you know, I mean, I, I teach a course where I don't use theory. I don't use theory. Every day I just come in and I tell students, let's look at the data on this and this, and let's just be guided by the data. Now, the mainstream would, would bring up the Lucas, the Lucas critique, but um, you know, I think the data tells us a lot. That's where you're gonna find the data. I tell my students, sorry, that's where you're gonna find the answers. And I tell my students, everything is empirical question in economics. So go and look at the data to see what it says. And you're gonna see that it invalidates much of neoclassical theory. And it's going to give you a lot of the answers about you know, I mean, how better to, to, to observe the real world as Keynes tells us than to look at the data. Okay. You know, the, 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 the Journal of Econometrics, which was started, I think in 1935, something like that. Econometrics originally was a way to criticize neoclassical theory. It was a way to look at the data and to run some regressions and to say, hey, there's a problem here. There's a discrepancy between the neoclassical theory and the data. Now it, it got, you know, it got absorbed and, and, and taken over and everything like that. But originally, you know, that's what, that's what the data was there for. Okay. The last question. According to the new consensus, the interest rate can be controlled. Does this still hold to open small economies? Yeah, 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 yeah. We, let's not mistake the concept of the ability to fix a rate and the consequences. So, I mean, that holds for any the, the Canada. We could choose to leave interest rates at zero if we wanted to. There's going to be consequences. Maybe there'll be some capital flights, et cetera, et cetera. And the same thing for the small economy. I'm pretty sure you can have the rate of interest that you want to quote Keynes, but there's gonna be consequences, right? And it's up to you to, to figure out whether you want to deal with that consequence. So if Mexico wanted to have an interest rate of 1%, it could, but you know, you're gonna have exchange rate problems, you're gonna have a, you know, other problems, but those are different questions. And so that's why, you know, small open economies, Developing economies tend to tend to put their interest rates close to where there's very little sort of exchange rate movements in order not to destabilize the exchange rate. Okay, so I think we have finished with the question, Jorge. Yeah, 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 yeah. it well, was the last. Eh, quiero agradecerle a todo mundo por sus preguntas. Esperemos que mañana se eh, conecten con el link que ya fue mandado. Si tuvieran alguna pregunta, avísenos. Luis Felipe, thank you very much for your presentation. Everyone is very happy about that. And we hope to hear you tomorrow. 11.30 Mexican time, 12.30. No, Canadian no, 1.30 Canadian time. 1.30, <laughs> uh, now it's two hours, sorry. Yeah, yeah because uh, we, we, we went ahead one hour yesterday. Okay. So that's why I logged in at 12.30 and I said, where are you? Uh, okay, sorry. En la mañana tuvimos así medio... Unos eh, hackers. Porque Luis Felipe me dice, ¿dónde está la conferencia? Espérate si todavía ya no estamos. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, uh, thank you very much then, uh, Luis Philippe. We hope to see you tomorrow. Uh, and oh. we hope that the people will still be will be interested and link. And I think tomorrow is the challenge what to do. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to both of you. I'll send you my uh, presentation from today because some people were asking for it. Okay, yes. thank you. So just contact, please. Uh, thank you, Raquel. Thank you. Um, so please contact Jorge or Noemi if you want the presentation. Thank you. Gracias. Bye. See you Gracias. tomorrow. See you tomorrow.